So today is Father's Day and we are going to focus in on a little Father's Day message. I want you to open to the book of Proverbs, if you will, and we're going to go to chapter 14. And then if you have um, another ribbon or finger, put it in Ephesians chapter number six. And we're going to go over to um, look at a verse or two over at Ephesians chapter six. So it's a great privilege and an honor to honor our dads because you you do a great job and you live in a very crazy world with lots of challenges, but nonetheless, God has anointed you and you are anointed by God for the purpose and for the task and you will get the job done because you have God's help and God's strength behind you. I know that sometimes it's exasperating trying to be the leader of your house because you are the leader of your house. You're the guy who is steering that ship or ought to be steering that ship. Now, whether you are a father already or whether you're a father of young children or a father of older children, or maybe you don't have children, but you're a father to be at some point in your future, you have to understand the seriousness of your job and what you do as a dad. So this morning, I wanted to go over to Proverbs chapter 14 and in Proverbs 14, and I want to go to verse 26. It says this, it says, um, in the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence and his children will have a place of refuge. So what we understand from this is that in the fear of the Lord, in the fear of the Lord is a, is, a, is a secure foundation or a secure fortress or hiding place. So what we learn, the very first thing that dad needs to learn, I mean, if you're gonna be an effective father and you're gonna be a father that's gonna be able to have the wisdom and have the direction from God and the help that you need from God, uh, you're gonna to have to understand that it all begins with God. You see, having God in your life makes the difference as to whether you will be a father who will provide a strong and secure household or not. It all begins with God. Having God in your life, he's going to give you the direction, give you the judgments, give you, so it all begins, give you the help and the strength that you need to father in these crazy days and these crazy times we live. So I love this verse because whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress. That's one version says. Whoever fears the Lord has a, provides or has a secure fortress that he provides for his children. So a stable, a good, and a secure home begins with a dad who fears the Lord, who has God in his life. That's why every man, I don't know where you are from today or what your background is or whatever it is, you need God in your life because having God in your life is what provides a secure fortress for your children. What is a fortress? It's a place of safety. It's a place of protection against warfare and against uh, you know, the enemy. And we all, every dad needs to see himself as one who provides a shelter for his children. But you need to have God in your life. It all begins with a walk with the Lord. So whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress and their children, and for their children, it will be a place of refuge. Um, Every dad provides a home or ought to be providing a home that children want to come back to. They want to come and spend time with you and come and be in your presence because they realize that they, every time they come home, it's a place of security, it's a secure refuge, it's a place of strength, it's a place of peace, it's a place of power. So it all begins with dad having a life that is dedicated and honoring God. It, you know, if you're gonna receive honor in your life, you have to give honor somewhere and it all begins by giving honor to the Lord as a man. So. So I want to be, and you want to be, and we all want to be, all the men in this house, we want to be men who fear the Lord. And again, that fear is not that terror or fright, but it's that respect and that honor that we give to God. We understand that without God, we are nothing. Without God, we cannot produce anything. You can't be the type of dad that God would want you to be without God in your life. Can I get a better amen than that? And by doing so, you provide for your children a very secure refuge, a place of refuge and power and peace and comfort. All right, so let's go over to Ephesians chapter six. And so we're talking about the dads and that's really your number one responsibility is to fear God, is to have God in your life, to be a lover and a follower and one who hungers after God and, and providing that secure fortress for your children. But let's see what it says about the children in chapter six and verse one. It says, children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Verse two says, honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. So now we talk about the children for a minute and 
and it says, children, obey your parents. Now, if you're a younger child and you live under the, uh, the, under the leadership of your, of your father, like you're still uh, underage, then you are to obey your parents. And in obeying your parents, you honor God. And um, you see, the, the, word, the word teaches us that there's a blessing that comes with obeying and honoring your parents. And the blessing is that it will be well with you and that you will live a long life on the earth. And I believe with all my heart in that promise that, and this is one of the reasons why I think that, you know, the devil loves to unleash rebellion in the households and division in the households because if he can cause dishonor in the house, he can really get into a lot of people's lives and cause a lot of destruction. People are going to die early and not really live well on earth. But if you want to live well on, on earth and, and live a long and a healthy and a strong life, then it all begins by obeying and honoring your parents. Now, when you're young, you're in the obedience mood or mode, all right? So when you're young and you're underage, then you, you are required by the, the word to obey your parents. They're, they're there to lead you, to guide you, to help you, to shape you, to mold you, right? But the honoring part comes after you become of age, where you are now of age and you have your own responsibility and you understand and have a sense of right and wrong and you're legal or whatever it be, you turn 18, 19, you become your own man, your own person, all right? So now it comes from obedience, from obeying your parents to honoring your parents. So many of us in this room, we're beyond the age of obeying our parents, but we're in the age now or in this mode of honoring our parents. And that's what we're here to do today. We're here to honor our, our father for the fact that he is our father. And I love what the word says again. It says that this is the first, the first uh, commandment that comes with a promise. And again, that promise is that it will be well with you and that you will live long upon the earth. Your days will be lengthened because you have obeyed. And now that obedience comes over to the place of honoring your parents. All right. So today, that's what we're here to do. We're here to honor our parent, our fathers and to shed some love on them because fathers need to be loved. Fathers have a tough job. Fathers deal with a lot of things, you know, and, and you know, if you're like most dads, you know, most men, you hold a lot of things in and you don't share a lot of things even when you're afraid or you're, you're having, you know, trouble or whatever. You don't hold it. You don't let your, your kids know. You don't let your wife know. You just hold on to it and you just kind of push through and you deal with a lot of things internal because you're a man and you think that's the way it's supposed to be. And sometimes it is. But praise God, we honor our fathers today for the fact that they have taken this awesome charge from the Lord of parenting. And I want to help you today to be the best parent, the best father that you can be. Can I get a better amen than that? All right. We want you to be the best father that you can be. So I'm going to go a little different way that I went this morning, but just give you eight things that a father needs to look at and eight things that every earthly father should do. And the verse that I want to use, and Samuel put it up, is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and that would be verses 11 through 12. And Paul writes this, and he says about himself and the apostles that were with him, and he says, and he's speaking to the, children, uh, to the church at Thessalonica. He says, as you know how we exhorted, comforted, and charged every one of you, and listen to these words, as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So he talks about three things, exhort, comfort, and charge. And he said, that's what a father should do or does do with his own children. So the first three things that we just talk about quickly are exhorting, comforting, and charging. So every father ought to be an exhorter. And that means to give advice and to give warnings. And see, Dad, your responsibility is to give advice and to give warnings. Um, there are going to be things and dangers that you're going to see that your children aren't going to see. Even if your children are grown and they're older, Dad, you still have that anointing in your life to give warning, to give a word of exhortation, which would be an advice or a warning. Because there are things that you've experienced that your children haven't experienced yet, even though they may be adult. They still haven't experienced what you've experienced because you've gone before them. So you have this charge, this duty in life to exhort them and to warn them and to give them, give them caution as needed as necessary. doesn't matter how old your children become. You will always be their father and you should be a voice of exhortation in their life. Can I get a better amen than that? <laughs> so the second word that Paul uses in this verse is to comfort. So fathers ought to be comforters. And that's to give hope to your children. 
you know, dad, you, you can't always fall apart and, you know, you, you got to hold it together. And I've seen a lot of dads sometimes, you know, they get exasperated and they do fall apart and their kids see that. But really, the kids are looking to you to be a, a source of comfort and extre- of strength because that's what you're supposed to do. And sometimes you may feel like you're the one that needs the comfort, but really it's more important for you to give the comfort to your family. And that is a responsibility that we bear as men, especially, but most definitely as a father. So Paul says that you ought to exhort, you ought to comfort. So it means to give strength and it means to give hope. Uh, The greatest strength that your children should ever feel, whether they're young children or adult children, ought to be felt from their dad. They ought to feel your strength. They ought to know your strength. They ought to come by you and be with you and feel empowered and feel strengthened for having just been with you. And that's what we as men provide, um, and especially as a father to your children. So you ought to be a comforter. Number three, um, fathers should charge. And that, again, is another way of saying instruct or command. Sometimes, especially with younger children, you need to have a command. You have to have a commander's voice because kids sometimes are not going to go the way that you want them to go. So sometimes the commander has to come out. Come on out, commander, and just give a command. This is what we're doing. I don't care what you want to do. This is what we are doing. A father needs to have a commander's voice. So fathers should exhort, they should comfort, and they should charge. Now, this is what I wanted to spend a little time on because I think this is so important. Fathers should be the teacher in the household. Now, not the teacher of arithmetic and math and and these kind of subjects, academics, but should be the spiritual teacher in the house. And we take our, our verse from Deuteronomy chapter 18, I'm sorry, chapter 11, verse 18. And this is what Deuteronomy says. It says, therefore, you shall lay up, the, and this is God speaking to, <clears throat> through Moses, giving, giving us some instruction to the men. Therefore, you shall lay up these words of mine. What are the words of mine? That would be the word of God. That's the Bible. Shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul and bind them as a sign on your hand And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. In other words, you're you're never letting go of the word of God. That you're developing, charting, developing, growing your life, putting your life together bit by bit by the word of God. And it's before you at all times. And he says in verse 9, you shall teach them to your children. So as you're learning and growing, and every man, every father ought to be growing and developing and learning in the word of God. And it says as you're learning, now you're going to take that information and you're going to teach it to your children. Don't rely on the Sunday school to do the lessons that you ought to be teaching at home. Sunday school teachers are here to give the lessons and to really to support what you ought to be teaching at home to your children. So you ought to be teaching them the Bible stories. You ought to be teaching them the, 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 uh, the different things from the book of Proverbs, the book of wisdom. You ought to be imparting the principles from the word of God that you are learning. Take them, and if they're small children, try to reduce them to an understandable uh, form and give them to your children. So he said, you get filled up with the word, you learn and grow in the word, and then you take that word and you teach your children, you instruct your children. That's really the responsibility of every man who is a dad, who's a Christian man, all right? Uh, that's not the responsibility solely of your, mo- of your wife or the mother. Wife and mother will do that as well in support, but dad, you're the one that ought to be imparting the word of God. And don't be intimidated by that. Do it. Learn the word and then teach the word to your children. Teach the little principle by principle. You may say, well, I'm brand new at this. It doesn't matter at what level you are in in the word. You can start right where you're at. All you need to do is to learn something. And anything you learn, start to impart it to your children. Can I get a better amen of that? So he said, you shall teach them to your children. And notice what he says. Speaking of them when you sit in your house... When you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up, he said, that means that all all day long, you're looking for opportunities to impart and to teach and communicate the word of God to your children in some way, whether they're adult children or younger children, it does not matter. You will still always be your children's teacher. That's what God has anointed you to do, dad. Whether your children are two or 22 or 42, you still have the ability to be their leader, to be their guide, and to be their teacher over spiritual things. I need a better amen than than you're giving me. All right, now I like this one in verse 20. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. I love that. 
You see, if, if you have younger children in your house, you, mean, you, gotta, you, gotta write, you gotta write it on the doorpost. This is what we do in our house and this is what we do not do in our house. Because we are a godly home, we are a Christian family. There are certain things that we allow and there are certain things we don't allow. Come on, are you with me? As a matter of fact, you might have to even bring it to a more detailed uh, place. There are certain people that are allowed in this house and there are certain people that are not allowed in this house. You gotta write it down on the doorpost that all that would walk through your doors will know that this is a godly house and there's certain behavior that's allowed and certain behavior that's not allowed. I told a story this morning that recently I had a family gathering and one of my cousins has a boyfriend and they don't serve God, they're not very godly and they, they brought, uh, they brought the boyfriend, the boyfriend came and, and it got later in the day and he was just having, you know, he got very comfortable and they're standing around in my kitchen and they're talking and talking and all of a sudden he started to use a word, A, B, C, D, E, and I'll give you the rest. <laughs> and I stopped dead in my tracks and I turned to him and I said, hold it. I said, that kind of language is not allowed in my house. You come here, you leave that language at the front door. You don't use that language here. This is a godly house. And of course, they're young kids. I mean, it's amazing. You know, even in the gym, I'll tell you, even in the gym sometimes, these guys, the other day a guy was using, I mean, one word after another. I finally looked at him. I said, do you know any other words in English? <laughs> do you not, don't you, you're an intelligent man. You went to college. Can't you find some other words to describe what you're trying to describe without using a bop, 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 with every word that you're saying? You're hurting my ears. Oh, I'm sorry. See, they're very, very careful around me. And, you know, it's pretty salty in the gym. You know that. And, but these guys went around me. I don't hear one word. It's usually a new guy that comes in and says, ah, ah, ah. I just walk away. But, but you see, you see in, in your house, you have to set it on the doorpost. This is what happened. For me and my house, we're going to serve God. For me and my house, we're set on the things of God, on righteousness, you know. And so you may say, well, my, my, kids, my kids are bucking. You know, they don't want to, you know, they, they, well, don't worry about it. Let them buck all they want. When they turn 18, let them buck, buck, buck until they bunk their head against the wall somewhere. And they realize finally, when they get some sense knocked into them, that all that you have been imparting to them is for their good, for their health, for their strength, for their future. That a life with God is worth, is worth it that going out in the world and doing the world's way is a dead end street. Because the Bible says you do this, you provide this, you teach it, you write it down, you live it in the house. And that's one of the problems that we have to talk about, man of God. You've got to live this in the house. Let me say it again. You've got to live it in the house. You can't just mouth it off. You've got to live it in the house. Kids are going to respond more to what you do and what you are than what you say. You can't just be a sayer. You have to be a doer. All right. So if you want your kids uh, to, to grow up in this Christian faith, then you've got to demonstrate this faith. You have to demonstrate this by the actions and the activities of your life because otherwise you're confusing them. You're telling them one thing, but you're giving them a different example. And by doing that, you're telling them that you can't live this anyway. If you can't live it, how are they going to live it? If you can't demonstrate it, how can you require that they demonstrate it? You have to get the word in your heart and be changed by the word. It doesn't mean you don't make a mistake along the way because we all make mistakes. But even in your mistakes, you still come from a godly approach to correct that mistake. So when you make a mistake, you come back and you tell your family, I blew it, kids. I made a big mistake. Forgive me. That's not the way I should have handled it. That's not the way I should have spoken. That's not the way I should have done it. Forgive me. Now let's wipe the slate clean and let's start all over again. And let me try to correct this. And I ask your, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to ask your children for, your, for, for their forgiveness. Thank you for that weak amen. I heard an amen somewhere out there. It wouldn't be an awful thing for a father in sincerity to say, look, that did not, that action and activity did not live up to God's requirements for me or God's standard. Please forgive me and let's start over again because that was totally, absolutely incorrect. Can I get a better in and in? All right. So write them down on the doorposts of your house. You better, have your, you better have your guidelines set up in your house if you have younger children, even some of your older children. Uh, you know, there's certain things you just don't, like I've, I've seen, um, you know, I've seen and heard and, you know, kids get older and they move, they get a girlfriend and, you know, next thing you know, they're moving in the house with mom and dad. They're living in the basement. I mean, you know, we don't believe in that. If you're a believer, you, you should never allow that. Well, I'm afraid I'm going to lose them. Well, would you rather them go to hell? 
Or would you rather maybe have to lose them for a season until, like a prodigal, until they come to their senses and come to realize that you mean business and so does God? That's your decision. But even as an adult, there are certain things you, you, you know, uh, some years ago, um, my niece was dating a, a, a man, a, a guy, and, and um, they were coming to my house and they were going to stay overnight um, in, because, you know, they were dating and I think they were engaged at that time and they were coming to stay overnight. And I said to her, I said to her, listen, I said, I just want to make something very clear. You come to my house, but you can't sleep together. I knew they were living together. I said, but you can't, you can't do that. My, oh, no, no, Uncle Ray, I know, I totally understand. So I, I, the only room I had available was the basement. It's finished, it was finished. And it, it didn't have a bed, it just had a couch. I said, well, brother, you're sleeping down here. And I will be listening all night. <laughs> that's where you stay. And my niece stayed upstairs close to my bedroom. You just, you do, you're not married. You don't do that in my house. All right. We don't play house. Put a wedding band on your ring and then you can have the finest bedroom in the house if you want. All right. So you, you have to set those guidelines and those rules up at your doorposts in your house. And only you can do that, dad. Don't wait for mom to do it. You know, everybody tries to blame mom. Well, you know, your mother, you know, your mother. No, what about, no, it, it, I'm your father and that's what I say and that's what we're doing. Come on, give me a better amen than that. All right. All right. So what should fathers teach? So let's just go through a quick list of things that every dad ought to consider as uh, something that they need to teach their children. So number one, you ought to, the very first thing that every dad, every Christian father, now you may not be a father yet, but you will be. You may say, well, this message is not for me. I'm not a dad. Well, there could be a time in your life when you are a dad. Or you may say, well, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a father of older children. As I said before, you will always be your children's teacher, no matter how old they are. All right. So what should fathers teach? Well, number one, they ought to teach to love God and always put God first. Teach them to love God and to always put God first. This is of great importance. This has got to be number one on the list. You ought to be teaching them and you ought to be teaching them again by your own example. That you love God and that God comes above all things in our household and in our family. God is first. I try to do that. I'm just an uncle and a brother and a brother-in-law, uh, you know. And I try very hard to let everybody know in my family, God comes first in everything that we do, in everything that we are. God is honored in our lives and we put him first. And I love God more than I love anybody or anything on this earth. I love God. And you need to, you need to teach that to your children. What's another thing that you ought to teach your children? Well, you ought to teach them to serve God. But the only way you're going to be able to teach your children to serve God is if you serve God. Again, you can't tell them to do something you yourself don't do. But you ought to teach them to serve and you ought to have them serve alongside you. So you're working in the, in the church and in the kingdom and doing kingdom work, whatever that kingdom work is for the, for the Lord. Have your children work with you. Have them come alongside you and see what you do and teach them to do what you do and, and help them to, to, to learn your job and what you're doing in the kingdom, except, especially in your church. Like we say here, you get your ushering, bring your kid along. Let's teach him to usher. And when he gets old enough, we'll put a usher's suit on him, an usher's jacket on him, let him usher. You know, whatever it is that you do in the church, let your children see you do it and train them along the way and help them to do it alongside you. That's how they will become servants in the house of God. But if you don't serve the Lord, you don't do anything in the house of God, then you have nothing to train or teach your children with. All right. All right. So then what's another thing that we we t we teach our children that they are ultimately accountable to God. Now, if they're younger children, they're accountable to you right now. But as they age, you have to realize that, you know, they come to, of age, they become accountable to the Lord directly. And that's a serious issue right now. You're under they're under your direction and under your leadership. But eventually they're going to become individually accountable to God for their lives and the things that they do. So as a father, you have to teach and train your children to respect, to honor, to love God, because ultimately they're going to become accountable to God for themselves. You can only bring them so far as, as a dad, but then you turn them over, back over to the Lord, and they become accountable to God now. So you have to, um, that's something that you need to teach them, you know. You're not going to be accountable, you know. You, you know maybe they're in their teens and they're still, you know, a little crazy, whatever. 
you know, you say, look, you know, you can fool me, but you can't fool God. You can get away with this with me, but you're not fooling God. And ultimately, son, daughter, you're going to be accountable to God for your life and what you do and what, what, what happens in your life. You ultimately are going to be accountable to God. So teach them that lesson in any way that you can. Teach them to have intimate fellowship with God. They need to learn how to fellowship with the Lord and how to have intimate relationship with him in prayer time and, and just being in the presence of the Lord. And um, it's a powerful, very powerful thing that they, um, they need to learn that God wants to spend time with you. And it's in that quiet time with the Lord where your faith will grow and your relationship with the Lord will grow. Absolutely teach them the word of God. And as they're younger, and even if they're older, you can still teach them the word of God. You can still impart to them, you know, the Bible lessons. And one of the great ways, especially if they're older, one of the great ways that you can teach the Bible to your children is to give your own testimony of how God worked in your life, where you came from and what happened in your life. And, you know, I try to do that with my nieces and nephews and just tell them stories about how I grew up in God and what the Lord's done in my life and how blessed I am for having followed and served him all these years and where I came from and what it was like before I knew the Lord. But now that I serve him, the blessings that I have in my life. So you need to teach them the word of God and, and the principles from the word, right? Here's one, honor and respect. We need to teach and you need to emulate that honor and respect. And the first way you're going to teach that honor and respect to your, to your children is by honoring your mother. Honoring your mother. That was a big no-no in, in when I was growing up that, you know, you, you could do just about anything to my dad, but you couldn't disrespect my mother because that would really get him very upset, you know. And I think my sister would testify he had great love and respect for my mother. You know, I was telling the earlier church today, my sister will testify to this, that all my years growing up, I never heard my parents call each other by their names. They always called each other honey. He would call her honey. She would call, even when they were arguing, they would call each other honey. <laughs> and I, was, I thought of this this morning, Jella, you would remember this, that it was that year that dad bought mom a diamond band for her wedding because when they first got married, he couldn't buy her anything. They didn't have money, so he bought her a cheap little ring. But he bought her a, a, a wedding band, and I don't know if it was even really that expensive, but it was awesome to him and ultimately to her. And I remember when you wrapped, you did, you wrapped the box and the big box was there and it said, to Julia from Zeno. And I looked at the box, I said, that's weird. They don't even call each other by their first name. <laughs> to Julia from Zeno. And I thought, you know, and I would hear my, my friends call their, or hear their, my friends' parents call each other by their names but I never heard my parents ever call each other by their names. They always referred to each other as honey. That's all I ever remember. Honey this, honey that, honey. Even when they were angry, they, they yelled at each other, honey. So, but my father always taught us to respect my mother because she was our, my mother. And, you know, basically my mother got her way just about all the time. You know, my father was pretty stubborn. But my mother got, got her way no matter, you know, what she wanted. She ultimately got it because my father really truly did love her and did honor her. And he taught us that lesson of honor and respect uh, at a young age. So dads, that's something that I think, even though my father died when I was 14, so I, you know, I do have memory, but I don't have a lot of memory, but I do have a pretty good memory of him. Um, but he taught these lessons at such a young age and they stuck with me forever. You know, I, I was taught to respect women I was taught to respect people, all people. That was just something that my father and my mother inbred in us, you know, at a very, very young age. So dad, you teach honor and respect. That's the way you do it. And it has to start first with mom, you see. And mom, you need to give respect to dad because if all you do is demean him and put him down, you really lower him in the eyes of his children and you undermine his ability to lead your family and to, and to really garner that respect that he should have from the children because they respect you too. And if you're disrespecting authority in your house or disrespecting your husband, your children are gonna pick up on that and they're gonna, they're gonna follow suit with that. We wonder why sometimes, you know, we have people in the world today, especially a lot of men that disrespect women terribly. I would never think to disrespect a woman. I can remember when, I, see, in, in my house, we were, we were very huggy, lovey, kissy, huggy, that kind of thing, most of us. 
And uh, I can remember when I first started pastoring the church, you know, I would just reach out, huggy, kissy, lovey, everybody, until there were some people getting the wrong idea of my hugs and kisses, and I thought, I gotta change this right away. I don't wanna disrespect anybody or give a wrong impression to anybody. So I had to change the way that I greeted people in a more what would be acceptable or, not that it was disrespectful, but to some they were confused and I, I take that as a form of disrespect, amen? So one of the things that you as a man of God in teaching your children is to honor and to respect and it starts by honoring and respecting your wife. Here's one, teaching your children integrity. If you're not a person of integrity, how will your children ever learn lessons of integrity? You can't say one thing and do another. Be a person that can be trusted. Be a person of your word. If you say you're gonna do something, do it. If you say you're gonna do something to your children, carry it out, do it. You have to be a person of great integrity and you teach those lessons of integrity to your children by the way you live your life. And that's like the most important thing to me I'm very careful and very mindful of the way that I live my life. Because even though I'm not a natural father, I am a spiritual father to many. And I realize that the way I'm acting, the way I'm living, and what I'm doing in my life is a direct representation of who I am as a person inside. And I want to be certain that everyone around me knows the type of person I am. And it can be trusted that I am a person of integrity and that I simply uh, want to serve God and love people. So be a person of integrity and you prove that, you show that, you teach that by the way you live, all right? So make sure that before you promise something that you can fulfill that promise. Make sure that you are an upright individual and you, you do things with great integrity. You approach everything with great integrity. The way you handle money, the way you handle relationships, the way you handle uh, personal affairs in your life, that you handle it with great integrity because you're teaching your, even if they're older, you're still teaching them something, you see? All right, so integrity. Uh, another thing you ought to teach your children is faith. Teach your children how to operate in their own faith. You can only take them to a certain place in your faith, but now you ought to be teaching them, if you have young children, that's awesome. So as young children now, teach them lessons of faith. And as they get older, you've got to, you know, turn them loose. Like, I, I, like I'm, I don't understand. It's like, there are guys I know, grown men. They're like in their 30s. They still live at home. Their mother still does their laundry, makes their bed, cooks their food, and they don't even pay rent. If you lived in my house, I'd call you a bum. <laughs> By the time you become an adult, you have to learn how to go it on your own. You've got to learn how to use your own faith and trust God to you know, pay the bills and to get the things that you need and want and desire for life. You can't be always sucking off a of mommy and daddy. So, you know, your children get of a certain age, throw them out. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. <laughs> but, you know, just tell them, come on, it's time to get on your own now. I've taught you the lessons on faith. Now you trust God and you use your faith. Don't, don't, I'm not the, I'm not the sugar daddy here. You got to learn how to believe and trust God on your own. Because I'm going to tell you what, you, there's an old saying, you all know this saying, feed a man a fish, you feed him for a day, but teach a man to fish and you teach him for life. Teach him faith principles by the way, you know, by, by your own experience and by the way you're demonstrating it. Show them how God honors faith stimulate their faith to start using their faith and then turn them loose and let them start to see how God will bless them back. Come on, you see? Sometimes, here, here's a good example. They may want something and instead of giving it to them, why don't you say, why don't we pray? Let's use our faith for this thing and let's see what God will do and then sit back and wait and see what God will do on their behalf. Help them to get their faith unlocked. Amen? Amen? All right. So here's one. Teach them to be responsible, be on time, to live up to the responsibilities that they have. You can't be cutting out on these responsibilities. And man, man of God, that's one of the things that you teach your children by example is being a responsible person, living responsibly, taking care of your own, uh, your own things and doing it well is being a person of responsibility. Here's one. Teach them honesty in all things. Now, you can't teach them honesty and you're dishonest. You have to be an honest person up front. But teach them honesty in all things. You don't have to lie, cheat, 
and do all of these things to get ahead in life. If you're a godly man, we operate our lives by godly principles. Sometimes we may have to live up to a mistake we made. We're not going to cover it by lying. We're not going to cover it up by trying to sweep it under the rug. We're going to live up to it. We're going to face the music and we're going to go on. We're going to pay whatever dues we have to pay, but then we're going to move on from there and we're going to see how God will you know, fix the whole problem or whatever. Honesty. It pays to be honest. I can't believe the amount of dishonesty, the lying that sometimes goes on with Christians. They just don't know how to tell the truth or they tell what I call half truths. Let me say it again. Half truth is no truth at all. Right. Half truth is not any truth at all. So as a man of God, as a dad, you've got to teach honesty in all things. You're the only example that your young children are going to see and they're going to emulate everything you do. Here's one. Teach them how to pray. They need to know how to pray. Let them hear you pray. Let them hear you praying. And um, bring them in. Maybe grab their hands. Say, come on, we're going to have a time of prayer. Just you and me. Pray for five minutes. Just to, maybe at night before you go to bed. Say your prayers together. It is so important for dad to lead the way. Oftentimes dads wait for mom to do it. But dad, you ought to be doing that. They need to see a man praying and pouring out his heart to God. That's what the world, that's what your children are crying for. That's what the world is crying for. True godly men who love God, honor him, respect him, are people of integrity, who know the word of God, who know how to pray, know how to use their faith, know how to reach out to God. And that's what you ought to be imparting to your children. Here's, here's my, um, well, this, this is the last one on this list of what fathers should teach, is to etch in the minds of your children that God has a plan and a purpose for their life. Whether they want to hear it, whether they don't think it, whether they want to reject it, whether they fight, fuss, fume, kick, spit, or hiss, it doesn't matter. God has a plan and a destiny for your children. The fruit of your womb is blessed. And part of that blessing is that God is indelibly marked in their, in their future a destiny and a purpose, something that God is going to bless them with and use them for in their lives. You just keep telling them. You teach them over and over again that no matter, you can stray as far as you want to go. You could be as rebellious as you want to be. You can stray as far from God as you want to stray. But the long and the short it is, as for me and my house, we're going to serve God. As for me and my house, God will be number one. And he has, he has a destiny and he has a purpose for your life that will come to pass. You've got to proclaim it over their lives. You must speak it over their future, right? So dad, you need to teach them that no matter what. And the way you, the way you say it is hopefully you're going to come to your senses one day. Even if they're adult children and they're still kind of floundering around in their relationship with God, you still need to tell them God has a destiny. God has a purpose. And the sooner you surrender to God, the sooner you give your heart to the Lord, the sooner you give up the fight, there, you know, there was a, a, a play or a movie once said, my arms are too short to box with God. <laughs> Just remember, when you finally give up the fight, then God will take over and you will see how quickly your future will come to pass and what a good future it will be. All right. All right. So let's just... Um, Let's just go over this real quick and, and we'll be done. We'll send you out of here. What fathers need to know. Father, you need to know that your children need lots and lots and lots of love. No matter whether they're young or old, adult or, or still children, they need lots of love. And they need you to say it and they need you to show it. Yeah. Right? Um, can't just say, well, I work hard and that's my expression of love. No, that's not, that's not going to work. You need to, you need to say it. You need to tell them that you love them. Really important. Children need to know that they can make mistakes without you flipping out and losing your mind. Children are going to make mistakes and they are going to disappoint you away, you know, through, through life. But you can't always freak out and flip out. You've got to pull yourself together, get the wisdom of God and learn how to deal with those mistakes that your children make, whether they're young or old. Because um, one of the things you have to remember is that in young children, children learn by making mistakes. How many of you have learned from the mistakes you've made, right? We all have. So give them an opportunity to make some mistakes as long as they're not, you know, devastating mistakes that will be hard to, uh, to undo or to change. Children need your praise. You need to praise them for the work that they do and the good stuff that they do, all right? Uh, if they have an accomplishment, make a big deal out of it. Take them out. Buy them, buy them a gift. 
Do something worthwhile to let them know that you see their accomplishment and that you're proud of them. And it's more than just patting them on their head and saying, I'm proud. I mean, do something of quality. You know, tell them, absolutely, but show them something. Do something of quality, something tangible. Children need your forgiveness. Like I said before, you know, um, don't just tell them that you, you know, or don't, uh, you know, you need to tell them that you forgive them. Don't just expect that they know that you've forgiven them. When they make a mistake and maybe they know that they've disappointed you, it's important for you to go to them and say, look, I forgive you for that. And let's clean it up. Let's just pick it up from here and move on. Give them a hug. Give them an embrace. And let them feel your love and know that you are a fa- Because God is a God of faith. How many times do you screw up? How many mistakes do you make in a, in a life, right? In a, in a day or a week. How many times do you need to go before God and ask for forgiveness? Would you want to go before a father that said, no, this time I'm not going to forgive you. Or I'm going to hold this. If God held grudges against us, would, would that make you feel good? No. God doesn't hold grudges. He's a forgiving father and you ought to be a forgiving father too. All right. And they also need to know that there's never anything you would ever do that would cause you to reject them. There's nothing that they would ever do, no matter how bad it would ever be. You might be disappointed, you might be hurt, you might be all these other things, but you would never, ever, ever disown them or, you know, reject them. They would always be a part of your life. Children need that. Children need to see your tender side. They need an embrace. They need a kiss. I don't care how macho you are, get over it. Embrace your children. Hug them. I love what the little kids were saying here today. It made me... Just tickle me. Some of you dads are doing it right. Says, I love my daddy because he kisses me. I love my daddy because he hugs me. I love my daddy because he loves me. And that, that, well, that was not premeditated. That was all coming from their heart. And praise God, I say, if you're that kind of dad, you're an awesome, awesome, godly father because you hug and you love your kids. They, they feel that tender touch of a loving dad. That's what they need. Because how would they ever know what kind of man to select as a husband as they grow old if they never felt the tender touch of a father? If they never felt the warm embrace of a man who didn't have filthy thoughts in his head, but just absolute pure love for his child? Come on, man. Let them feel that pure love that comes from dad's heart into their life. How would they ever know to... See, they're going to be able to select a husband or reject somebody as a potential husband uh, for the women because they're going to know. They're going to know the tender touch of a dad and they're going to reject every other kind of touch in their life. Dear God. So what children need to know, and we'll finish up right here. Just give me two or three minutes and we'll be done. What children need to know. Children need to know that fathers are not perfect. Fathers make mistakes. They don't always mean to make those mistakes, but they're their own individual human beings and they have their struggles and challenges and fathers do make mistakes as perfect as you want your dad to be your dad is not perfect he makes whether he's whether you're a youngster or an older person your dad still makes mistakes and you know you need to forgive them you need to know they're not perfect children need to know that fathers need love and affection too you know when was the last time you as an adult just grabbed hold of your father and gave him a big embrace and just told him how much you loved him and how proud you are of him. Dear God, that would go so, so far because every dad wants the praise of their children. Every dad is, in, is totally blessed when their children tell them, but not only tell them, but show them. Show them that love and show them that affection. So children need to do that. Express that in some way to your, to your dad. Children should know their fathers need your, need your understanding. When they make mistakes, when they blow it, they need to know that you, you as a child are going to understand that, you know, they made a mistake, that maybe they didn't mean to do that, but they did. All right. Um, children need to know that fathers deserve your respect. And that's what we talked about in the opening is that you need to respect your father. And God promises a awesome blessing for that. Um, here's one children should tell their fathers that they love them again don't just don't just expect that they know it you need to tell them now here's Father's Day and many of you are going to go see your dads today don't bring an empty card if you bring an empty card bring a gift thank you for that weak amen I heard somewhere 
but it's the truth. You know, I mean, here, here you have an opportunity and don't wait till Father's Day to show this love for your dad. Be generous with your dad at all times, but bring him a gift. Give him a gift certificate to his favorite coffee shop or restaurant or barber shop or whatever, or give him just some plain old money that he can just spend any way he chooses, right? Or bring him a gift that you know, a gift of something that he wants, not what you want or what you want him to have. Something that he wants, buy him a gift and bless him so that he can, you know, he can just be blessed and, and, and feel that love and feel that appreciation that comes from you, all right? So fathers need, children need to tell their fathers that they love them and show that love. And children should show that love in practical ways. Do something practical for your dad um, and help him to understand that you love him, all right? Didn't Jesus say that? He said, if you love me, you will obey me. And why should we have anything less in our relationship between children and their fathers and fathers and the children? So show dad, do something practical. Show that love. Shed, just go, just shed all kinds of love on your dads today. Be grateful that you still have a father. Because not having had a father for most of my life, I miss that. I wish I had had the opportunity to have a dad for more of my life. So most of my life from a young boy at 14 till present, I have not had a dad. So if you do, love your dad because he won't be with you forever, you know. So don't wait. Like my father used to say, my father used to have a saying, he said, don't, respect me when I'm alive, not when I'm dead. <laughs> and it's absolutely the truth, right? So you want to respect and love and show this appreciation for your fathers while they're still living and while they're here, do all that you can do. And I love saying this. I always like to end this on Father's Day with this. This is what your father should be to you. And dad, please, this is what you should aspire to. Your father should be your hero. He should be your best friend. He should be your encourager, your teacher, your provider of all things. And most of all, and above all, your best godly example. He ought to be the best godly example of all. Hallelujah. We're going to stop right there on this Father's Day.